This just goes over the basics of how to do a reflection or a rotation or a translation. Here we're looking at, of course, a reflection to start. We know that uh, pre-image points move the same distance to the opposite side of the line of reflection. So again, that idea that when you reflect, this distance is the same uh, across the line on the other side. We also know that the line of reflection is a perpendicular bisector between them. So having said that, um, let's take a look at um, doing some of these. Let me slide this up and we can look at it there. And then let's make our, our graph. So we want to do A first. A says to reflect it over the x-axis. Um, and to do it, it wants to know what, where would we land. So over the x-axis, again, that would place us, uh, looks like we're five above, so it would place us here five below. The x becomes that line of reflection, and so our answer here, of course, would be a negative two, negative five. Now just take a quick look um, at the uh, values here and the values here. Reflecting over the x-axis seems to have changed our y values. All right, in the next one, it says for us to do uh, b over the y-axis. So let's try that, b over the y-axis. Here's our y-axis. b is here at the point 5 and 7. When we reflect it, it would land here, b prime. And it would land at, guess what, negative 5 and uh, 7. Once again, take a close look at the relationship between the original and its the pre-image and its image, that the x value is negated in that particular operation. Let's look at that last one. Now, this is interesting because it's going to reflect C over M, it's not a lot, it's not an axis. So notice here's our M. So this one we just count out. So it's three away. It'll be three on the other side for C prime over here. Again, the distance between those have to be the same. Um, but that puts us at nine and negative four. So you know how to do basic reflections. This leads us to something a little more interesting where we now apply what we've learned onto a diagram like this. So this says, the first one says, we're going to reflect over M, the point A. So let's highlight that line. There's M and A. Now, there are a number of students, watch carefully what some will do, who kind of say, oh, this is easy. It's over here. And then try to tell me that the answer is E. That is not our correct answer. Um, be careful about this because, remember, it's a perpendicular relationship. So this would be our answer. C would be the location of that particular answer. Now, let's go to the next one. The next one says uh, that we are going over the line N and we are C. Now in this case, I think that's an easy one for us to see. It would land over here on G as, as an option would be exactly where it would land. And I think most of you would see that that would be uh, the spot for it. Next, uh, this one is reflecting over R, the point D. So R is here, the point D is here. This is again where some students may find themselves traveling along the dotted line to give me an answer here. That is not the answer though. It's the perpendicular distance over here. B would be our answer. Finally, um, let's do the last one. Let me clear up a little space here. Um, the next one requires us, it lands at B after it reflects over P. So here's P it landed at B. Where were you before? Where was the pre-image? The answer is F. Be careful with these. Um, don't follow the dotted line necessarily. It has to be, when you do a reflection, it's always uh, perpendicular to the line of reflection. Be careful with that. 
Rotation is a much harder thing than a reflection for a couple of reasons. First, the direction things move. I want you to notice that positive rotations are counterclockwise. Nobody likes that, honestly. The reason I believe that is, is that when you get to other uses of a rotation, like um, on the coordinate grid, if you were to create a rotation, you would create your rotation in this manner. And this is counterclockwise. And again, I think that's because if this is kind of like your idea of being at zero, as you begin to make your angle of 40 degrees or 80 degrees, you are moving in this way. And so this, I believe, is why counterclockwise is the direction of a positive motion. Now, to actually perform a rotation, it's a little tricky just on a grid. A reflection, quite simple. But the best way to do this is actually to use a piece of patty paper. And the way it works is that you would like trace over this on that onion skinned patty paper. And then you perform about the center a rotation of 90. And that is a much easier process than kind of the counting it out as we are in that process. Now, when we do a rotation of this and, and uh, one way to do it is to kind of count your, your to your location. So watch what I'm about to do. And it's not as easy as the patty paper. I guarantee you that. But let's watch here how to get to C. C, I went up four and over three. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go four and three. So when I get C prime, I get it right here at C prime. When I go to get A, I went up five and left two. So I would go out five, and in this case, down two to be in this position. This is B where A prime is. And then finally, to obtain, um, to obtain B, I would go up seven and right five. So I'd go out seven and up five to this location. So seven and five would be B prime. Now, when I connect to those, those become my values for A, B, and C. And that's what they were asking us to find is that rotation. One thing I'd like to look at, let's look at these points. A was at negative two and five, and A prime became, check this out, negative five, negative two. Something happening there. Let's look at B. B was five and seven, and when it got done where it was supposed to be, it was at negative seven and five. Interesting. Let's see what happened to C. C was at three and four. And when it got done, it was at n negative four and positive three. Now, I don't want to reveal this too soon to you, but there's something kind of cool that's happening when you rotate by 90. There's a, there's a pattern that's happening in those points. That'll come later. Let's apply this to... Uh, a square as well. So this one says we're rotating 90 uh, point A about O. So here's our center A. 90 again, remember, is in the clockwise manner, counterclockwise manner. And so our answer would be G when we're all done. Let's try the next one. If we were doing the next one, we're going to go 270, and it's going to be D. So let's give that a shot. If we're centered at O, and we're starting at D, 270, it, that would be 90, 180, 270. We would land at F, wouldn't we? All right, let's take a look at the next one. Now the next one uses negative 90, so we're going to go the other way. So we're centered at O still. We're looking at E. And we're going to go clockwise because it's negative 90. So this would be G. 
The final one tells us a little clue that our center has changed. So the center is now F. And we are going to look at E, and we're going to go 90. 90 is counterclockwise, so it's going to move into this position at O. If it was 180, it would keep moving and land at G. But it was only a 90 degree turn, and so it would land at O would be its location. Translations have three ways to tell the story about a translation. The first way is called vector notation. This would mean, uh, based on the two being here, two to the right, because that's the x value, so it controls right and left. And this is negative four, so that would be down four. Notice another way to say that is, is in a vector or an arrow. That's two to the right, that would be here, and four down, right? Two and four down. These both say the same thing, vector notation and arrow. You can also use a coordinate rule, which would say two to the right, see how that works, and four down. The coordinate rule can tell the story. Just maybe also if we just said like something like this, what would that mean? That would mean up six, right? Because there is no, the zero denotes that it didn't go right or left, it just went up six. If we were writing that in a coordinate rule, it would look something like this. The X wouldn't change, and then it would be up six. It would be uh, Y plus six would be the value there. And so why I brought this one up is because there's plenty of students that want to put a zero or something there, but it just stays the same as the original, so it just stays as X. This says, here a translation has taken place from here to here, and they would like us to write the coordinate rule in the vector uh, notation. So I noticed that I went from negative four to negative one, that's an addition of three. And I noticed I went from one to three, that's two of these. So that would be its coordinate rule, and the vector is quite easy as well, just looks like this. Let's do one last item. So. This time they're giving us uh, the vector uh, negative one, negative two. So we apply that to our pre-image and that would mean we end up with an eight and a negative seven. That's how that would work. Here's another one. This means five uh, to the right. So that would, uh, ooh, I see what they're doing. They have the answer, so we're working backwards. So if we went five to the right to get there, we are at, we were at negative six is where we were at. That's kind of an interesting one. And then the other one was not changed. So I moved a little quickly on that, but did you see what happened there? I actually knew the answer. So I, I kind of go backwards. I reverse the process to go back to the original value at negative six, negative seven.